We still got a lot of attendees um, joining, so we're going to give everyone just another minute and then we will go ahead and get started. Um, in the meantime, you should see a poll coming up on your screen. If everyone can take a look um, and respond to the poll, we'll be doing a couple of these um, throughout the course of the webinar um, so that we can get to know our audience a little bit better. It's always interesting to see um, how many years experience we have on these webinars. They really um, vary pretty greatly. Looks like we've got a lot um, in the one to three and four to eight years. Uh, 12 plus years is definitely leading. Got a lot of good experience on our webinar today. It's great. Very good. Yep, it definitely looks like we have 43% uh, of our attendees have 12 plus years of experience on the webinar today. So that's that's great. 24% uh, one to three years. Welcome to the industry. 24% um, at four to eight, and 7% nine to 11 years. So that was interesting to see. All right, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today for our next webinar, uh, How to Effectively Speed Up Production Processes. Um, I'm Martha Lowe, Director of Education at ACMA, and I'm excited to be partnering with Medix USA for today's webinar. Uh, Medix is a global manufacturer of uh, technical textiles, as well as a provider uh, for lighter, stronger, more competitive composite structures. Uh, they offer core and fabric kitting and tooling services. I'm joined today by Stephen Misenick, of the Chief Technology Officer at Medix USA. Uh, Stephen began his career at Boston Whaler and has since played a key engineering role at several major manufacturers, um, including uh, Glastron, Super Hawaii, TPI, um, Martin Marietta, and Certex USA. Uh, his sectoral knowledge and technical management skills helped him to be a top consultant in the US composites market. Um, Stephen's got a lot of great uh, videos that he's gonna be playing for us today, so really looking forward and to seeing how some of the, the software and the automation and the uh, machines work. Uh, thank you for partnering with us, Stephen. We're really excited to have you here uh, teaching us about these technologies um, and how to use them in a really cost-effective way to improve your processes. Thank you, Martha, and thank you all for joining this session and taking the, uh, the hour out of your time today uh, to review this uh, production efficiencies. Uh, we're going to go through, uh, well, first of all, just want to uh, reiterate this. This is your session. Um, we already know some of this material, so if you have questions or comments, please feel free to, uh, to ask. Stephen, I think we've lost your audio. If you if you're muted, there you go. Okay, how's that? Yep, sounds great. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I have uh, over 30 years of composite experience, ranging from design to uh, manufacturing, process engineering responsibilities, all the way through upper management and operations. Um, the final operations at Mark Marietta were responsible for the R&D as well. So whatever came across the desk, we had to make money at. Uh, so we're very, uh, very in tune to labor efficiencies and what that means to the cost of goods sold to the products that we put out there from a composite perspective. Uh, some of the design and manufacturing uh, programs that I've worked on, um, we did our first Holland Fusion in 1993, uh, closed molded and, and never looked back uh, from infusion or closed molded uh, on a 64 foot Sundeer. Um, that's a circumnavigation sailboat, cutter sailboat, single handed sailboat that goes around the world. Uh, we started off uh, infusing that Holland deck and small parts and so forth. Um, any type of transportation, buses, cars, people movers, amusement park rides, and so forth were part of, uh, part of the process. So we're very well versed in the infusion process. 
and what it takes to infuse different uh, different geometries, different materials, and so forth as it relates to the uh, composite technology. Uh, some of the uh, a couple of photos, uh, one piece electric car that was a body and white we did for Selectria, 420 pounds total. That was uh, carbon and e glass, uh, two piece uh, North American bus industries transit bus, both the 40 foot on the top and the 45 foot version. And you'll notice on the 45 foot version, there's no dual axle. That's how much weight we were able to save uh, about 30 percent over the steel composite. Um, amusement park ride, you may have been on it, uh, as well as uh, a capsule. Uh, people mover, Detroit Northwest Terminal, uh, composite truck bodies, uh, trailers, flatbed trailers. There's no metal on that other than the landing gear um, and the axles, obviously. Everything bolts to the composites. Uh, package delivery car uh, and a tremendous amount of branches for an interactive zoo uh, that you might be familiar with, and a host of wind blades. Uh, my personal uh, footprint was on the uh, 26 and 30 meter blades from Mitsubishi. Uh, getting to the marine side, uh, 90 foot two motor hull in the US, uh, went up to 130 footer uh, overseas as far as process engineering. Uh, design and analysis as well as process engineering for a 70 foot, two foot ferry uh, built out of epoxy and carbon aramid. Uh, so it was a carbon um, infusion as well as this 50 foot Cray Valley, uh, which was the around the world champion in uh, 1998. Uh, that was the first uh, full carbon epoxy uh, infusion for a uh, single handed race boat. And there's a shot of the 64-foot Sun Deer, which was the first infusion in 1993. So we have a little bit of background on the processes associated with it. Material selection is important, as well as the tooling aspect. Uh, so it all kind of runs in together, and we're very familiar with all those aspects. Today we want to talk about Medix. Medix USA, who are we? Uh, you may have heard of us. You may have seen our ads in Pro Boat or Composite World magazines. Uh, but we're going to tell you a little bit who we are and what we do. Uh, we're going to talk about tooling, the advancements in tooling, uh, in spraying, uh, the lamination or layup, and some of the process uh, enhancements that we've seen moving forward. And then, of course, we'll summarize everything at the end. Medix, who are we? Medix is an international company with a wide range of composite products and services, technologies, value added, if you will. Uh, close to 1,000 employees in four locations on the globe, total of uh, about 4.5 million square foot of uh, manufacturing space. A little bit of history timeline, next couple slides. Uh, 1940, uh, Teletex, or if you will, the first canvas hair cloth interlining production started in 1940. Uh, textile coatings in 1979, uh, Teletex, uh, our founder, uh, Errol, uh, in 1978, established the Teletex line in, in Turkey. Uh, our investment came in Medix Composites material production, if you will, in 2003. 2018, we'll jump to 2018, uh, the facility in North Carolina in, uh, outside of Charlotte in Gastonia was, uh, was occupied and the first machines put in the place. Tycor is our production line uh, for our fiber reinforced engineered core structure. And of course, Turk Quality is a huge program in Turkey um, that, that they won in 2019. And then the introduction of SAP in 2019 as well. Short look at key dates, 2003, the start of Medix Composites, uh, first multi-axial line and entry into the textile world. Uh, in the knit aspect, uh, woven was going on. Weaving happens as well. Um, 2004 was the first JEC uh, footprint, and 2005 and 6 where we received the uh, Lloyd's and DMV type approvals for the fabrics. 2005, the Tulsa Turkey uh, operation unfolded. Uh, 2006 to 2010 was really a good uh, a good quarter for us on our alliances with the Bold. This allowed us to gain the market share in that Scandinavian marketplace as also as 
improving our infrastructure and our quality systems to our uh, wind market that really started uh, medics off into the uh, the field of advanced technical textile production. 2006, uh, development of the RTM or RTM light range of fabrics. Uh, they're called Medicore, um, which are highly drapeable uh, RTM type or uh, infusion mats, as the industry likes to call it here in the US, uh, came to light in 2006. And in 2018, we acquired the facility in, uh, in Gastonia, about 140,000 square foot on 30 acres. Uh, phase one was the introduction of the technical textile lines, uh, both woven and NCF are done under that roof um, using glass, e-glass, aramid, uh, a wide range of fiber inputs. Um, we do fabric kit cutting as well under that roof. We also do our, medic or our uh, Medicore line, obviously, and our non-woven line. We also make the polypropylene core that goes into the Medicore product. Uh, we don't uh, rely on the outside sources for that. We have a uh, operation inside our four walls to develop that fabric, both in a standard polypropylene and as well as a fire shield product, which is a flame retardant version of that polypropylene core. Um, fabric cutting is done, as I said, and then we have, uh, we've added recently in December, uh, foam kit cutting uh, operations as well with a CNC operation for some PET foam for a customer of ours. Phase two is including the foam car cutting and core kin. Uh, we do offer vacuum consumables as well, disposables, vacuum bags, fuel plies, flow media, and that type of thing as well. Manufacturing locations, there's four across the country. Uh, two of them in Istanbul, Tuzla, uh, Manessa, a little bit on the coast, if you will, uh, and Gastonia, North Carolina, outside of Charlotte. We do have a growing distribution network, uh, heavily populated in the European sector for sure. In the North American market, we are not a uh, distributor in the same sense as we are in Europe, but we do offer uh, some competitive advantages on the distribution network here in the US. Some of the activities that we do, again, production of the high performance re uh, requirements or uh, reinforcements relative to uh, NCF or woven. Uh, wide range of inputs, as I said, uh, carbon, E-glass, S-glass, R-glass, uh, production and process of consumables, a peel ply, flow cloths, uh, that type of thing we do as well. Uh, production of core kit materials, consumable kits, fabric kits are, are part of our portfolio as well. And in uh, Manissa, we have a production of molds and plugs, uh, first rate. Uh, we have some U.S. customers that are actually uh, are purchasing tooling from uh, from the Manissa plant, which is very economical. Uh, we do prototyping for second, third articles as well. Um, RTM, RTML, um, closed mold. Uh, we have a tie core line here in the US, which is a fiber or glass reinforced core on a PIR uh, foam base. And we uh, helical wrap e-glass. Uh, production of composite components. Uh, we do that in our European uh, Headquarter in uh, Kapisvar, which didn't show up, by the way, on the other slide, but uh, we do have an operation in Kapisvar, Hungary as well. And we do composite uh, manufacturing there for a couple of customers. Training and education services, uh, that's become a big deal in the European side of things, actually on a global basis as well. We an, operate uh, on a uh, bi-yearly basis. Um, we offer courses in RTM, RTM Lite, if you will. And to graduate the course, you have to actually make the tool and use the tool to manufacture a part. So it's not just classroom type, uh, it's hands-on understanding what you're doing, why you're doing, and the philosophies behind it is, is becoming extremely popular. And of course, testing. We have a, uh, a lab that's being uh, GL certified uh, that takes care of uh, the ISO or ASTM testing that we're familiar with on this side, tensile compression, flexible interlaminar shears and so forth, um, that operation. Management systems and certifications. Um, the Gastonia facility is ISO 9001 and we're working towards the 14,000 and uh, the 18,000 as well. Uh, Istanbul, uh, Manissa, and Kapaspar factory have uh, have those. They've just beaten us to us. You know, we're two years old or three years old, and they've been around for a little bit. 
So Stephen, I think um, as you're getting ready to transition into some of your um, next section, we have um, just a couple of polls that we want to launch here. Um, so you can learn a little bit about who's in your audience. The first one we're asking, uh, do you currently use glass or carbon reinforcements in your facility? Now you just spoke about this a little bit. Um, in, in, yep. no, that's a good question. Inside, uh, technically inside of Medix Composites or the Medix Group, yes. Uh, carbon, E-glass, R-glass, um, all of that aramid as well is being produced. Specifically in the U.S., we do not have carbon manufacturing as of yet. Um, as you know, that takes a little bit of uh, a little bit of arranging with the carbon uh, being as as uh, as conductive as it is. Uh, we need to make the space and so forth. So uh, we will bring carbon into the U.S., uh, but right now we we receive our carbon from our Turkish colleagues, which is very competitive. Uh, the same input. Tore, Toho, AXA, I mean, all those are um, the inputs we use and we utilize their, their uh, manufacturing for our global, or, or really our global use, but our use in the U.S. as well. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing in the poll that's on the screen right now. It looks like 78% uh, of your attendees use glass, 16% use carbon, and 6% use a different product. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we had one more question. Uh, there should be a second poll up on everybody's screen uh, right now. It says, do you currently use core material or vacuum consumable kits in your facility? Let's see what these responses say. Yep, it looks like, yeah, it looks like we're going to land about the same. We'll give it just another second. All right, it says 65% of your attendees use core materials, 18% use vacuum consumable kits, and 16% of your attendees use a different product. No, that's great. Uh, kitting is, uh, is a value-added service that we, that we provide, obviously, uh, both glass and core kitting. Uh, so the more that we can make use of that, the more labor efficiencies, uh, savings, and so forth. And we'll touch on that a little bit uh, as we go down to the presentation. Very good. Thank you. All right. And I think your next section, yep, tooling. There you go. Okay, we're going to talk about tooling a little bit and adaptive molds, if you will, or scaling one-off molding. And the uh, molding is the operations uh, move forward. Uh, mold fabrication requires a lot of uh, manual tools as well as CNC milling, uh, obviously, to uh, get the surfaces that we need. Um, they both demand um, a good use of material, space, workers associated with uh, putting all that together. Um, manpower production space also and the materials for mold making probably exceed the actual utilization of the mold in some cases. In fact, in other words, it takes more time and effort to develop the tooling uh, than it does to go through the cycle of the, the actual mold. Um, adaptive molds, they can be reconfigured pretty quickly from mold shape to mold shape uh, within minutes um, as it goes through the cycle, uh, the cycles, the cycles, the mechanism through it. So we don't generate any waste. There's no redundancy. There's no um, uh, excess labor associated with it. Your footprint is the same on your production floor of uh, between mold and mold. And we do have a cost reduction with the material use uh, and the waste associated with that uh, tooling fabrication. Uh, it can really decrease the product time, uh, time to market. Uh, you can get out there pretty quickly. It's environmentally friendly. You don't have any VOCs or anything that you're spraying around to, to develop the tools. Um, CO2 emissions have been uh, saved on adaptive molds for this Kuwaiti International Airport for uh, uh, Terminal 2 construction. It was, it was, it was produced off of, off of a adaptive mold. Uh, that's huge, full grown forest, four years on a full 14 and a half square mile of the airport. ADAPA, ADAPA molds, which we'll talk about and I'll give you I, I, insights to that particular company. The main business is to develop customized adaptive molds. Um, their service and maintenance is 
they either come hands-on or it's remote control. A lot in the past year has been remote by online communication, which has worked out very well. And they do have some uh, rental molds, if you will, to uh, familiarize everyone with their uh, with what they can do and how they may they may help uh, the technology that you have put forth. One-off molding processes basically are it's a long lead time, long runway. You have the storage, you got to bring in your materials, you have warehousing, uh, then you have to design, manufacture uh, to develop the tool both in the master plug and the production mold. Uh, you got to put those molds somewhere when you're done um, or in the use. Um, you have quality, you have the traceability associated with it, you have the facility management, uh, and of course, uh, lead time associated with uh, wherever you're going to put that mold, bring it out, push it back into production, and so forth. Uh, part development it just goes on. I mean, you're going to have measuring, you're going to have tolerance and quality checks for any type of tool that you're going to use, and then, of course, your delivery. In other words, it's a long lead time between the time that you push the button to, to start to develop a mold till the potential end where you're actually using it. With the adaptive mold process, basically, you can change mold shapes within minutes. It's basically on a memory stick. You have a 3D model that's uh, controlling the, the application itself, and you can easily uh, turn, that, turn that model into a uh, molded shape within moments. You take your 3D file, uh, computer automated, basically from a log file, you are trace a bit, tracing um, the actual shape. So you have a log of the actual contours that you have and then the delivery can be just in time. But you're utilizing the technology that's available today in the CAM, uh, in the CAM world to go from a 3D shape uh, in the model to a 3D shape in the part. Uh, some of the components associated with an adaptive mold, uh, you'll have the molding. How, what, what do you need to mold this thing? Uh, well, you need a protective sheet that's over the actuators, if you will, or a membrane that's underneath that protective sheet that you're molding on top of. You have the uh, support brackets that's holding that membrane in place uh, that's magnetic, and then you have your what we call flexible rod systems to move up and down uh, depending on what you want to do with your mold uh, in the shape associated with it. Uh, as far as steering or how you're going to control where you put what on the mold, uh, we have 3D laser uh, projection systems. It's common in the industry now, control units. Uh, linear actuators are really helping define the shape of the part, and they do have uh, maximum and minimum radiuses, if you will. Um, and the uh, stepper motors and the adaptive tools is basically the uh, the program associated with a uh, that, that can be run off like for example a 3D Rhino uh, program. Uh, they have a user interface that uh, will piggyback onto that onto that particular program. Um, Formwork, uh, you know, the add-ons. Add what are we going to do on the sides? Uh, how are we going to make the shape? Or, or you just don't want the composite to fall off the edges, so you have to hold everything together. And most of it's a magnetic silicone uh, that you can lay up against that comes right off, and then you have your laser-guided positioning systems associated with um, with laying up specific parts of that tool. Adaptive molds can also be used quite effectively for thermal forming core uh, to drive weight out of a product. Um, and the marine industry can save weight when using thermal form core. There's no doubt about it. And adaptive molds are key to, um, to getting a whole hull section uh, or bulkheads or that type of thing. Uh, well, maybe not bulkheads because those are pretty straight, but uh, stringer systems and so forth that have some shape or geometry to them you can uh, provide on the adapt a tool. Um, one tool can do a variety of different shapes. It's a short uh, video. Agapa offers a range of molds designated to different materials, such as concrete, thermoplastics, glass fiber, and a different type of composites. The adaptive mold enables production companies to fabricate curved surfaces cost-effectively and allow them to scale their production rapidly. Thereby, architects and designers can create more free-form constructions or shape new environmentally friendly materials. The adaptive mold is controlled by loading the original 3D drawing into the Adapter tool software that lets you create the necessary production files with a few clicks. 
Simply transfer the files to the Molds control unit and select the first panel to mold. From CAD to production in no time. The adaptive mold from Adapa can, within five minutes, shape single or double curved surfaces. This shortens the production time as you do not need to wait days or weeks for mold manufacturing. With the Adapa tool software, you also can generate files for a laser projector that can mark up placement of materials, sides, or where to place ornaments on the casting surface. With Adapa's adaptive mold, it is cheaper and faster to produce non-repetitive curved panels compared to alternative methods like CNC milling. After the molding process, the adaptive mold is repositioned, ready for positioning to the next mold shape. Thereby, a single mold can replace a countless number of unique molds and reduce your storage requirements. A standard adaptive mold from Ad Upper is financed by reduction in time, cost, and waste materials. My apologies for that uh, short, <laughs> short ending, but it gives you an idea of how the tool is used and uh, what the potential is. Next, we'll talk about a spray up applications, uh, robotic high pressure systems. Basically, it provides you with the maximum flexibility in the spraying operation for uh, large, large parts. Uh, you can increase your productivity. Um, it, can tr it controls or great control over uh, the trajectory or the spraying pattern um, that's optimized basically with, uh, with not having to use human movement back and forth, the repetitive motions associated with spraying. And you can optimize your material consumption. You have uh, integrated mixing uh, and change systems potential. And you can, again, optimize your spray pass. Um, material optimization, if you're optimizing the spray mode or the path, you're optimizing the material waste and so forth. And you don't have the OSHA or the, uh, the health and safety issue with someone actually sitting in there with a mask on and spraying uh, whatever, either resin or gel coat associated with it. Uh, the spray not only works for, uh, you know, works on a variety of substrates, uh, automotive, metal, uh, plastics, wood, ceramics. It's really, uh, it's really a, a end-all to be-all associated with an application. Um, short video on its.
The next thing we want to review is uh, a little bit about the layup process and what we can do to optimize uh, the layup. Um, basically, preforms, glass and core kits really allow for, and they should be really made use of, the optimization of your laminate design. Um, using preforms or glass kits allows the laminate designer, whoever designed the, the particular product, to ensure the fidelity of that laminate is going to be as what was designed. You don't have to worry about uh, material being skewed in the processor and the tool moved around a little bit because the patterns are exact. Uh, they fit in one spot, one orientation, and uh, that always have the correct fiber orientation. Uh, your overlaps are consistent, your laminate stack is consistent, um, and your obviously your orientation is exact. Core placement, um, the geometry is weight efficiency. If you have correctly uh, spaced core, uh, tight edges, uh, seams and so forth, you're not going to increase a lot of weight uh, by uh, filling with needless resin and so forth. So you're, you're able to really optimize both weight and cost. If you're saving weight, you're saving resin cost as well. Uh, your raw material consumption, you don't have any scrap. Quite frankly, the scrap is on the uh, on the side of the manufacturer providing the uh, uh, the core kits. Uh, that being said, uh, having a flexibility in the manufacturing side at Medix, uh, we can tailor a. We're not stuck to a 50 inch or a 60 inch roll uh, for fabrics, if you will, broad goods. We can develop an 83 and a half inch wide roll if that's going to be the optimization nesting program for that particular product. So it allows us the flexibility in the manufacturing side to develop big roles uh, for consistent uh, core kitting and that type of, we're not constrained any longer. Uh, we can really optimize everything, which is a labor and a cost savings downstream to the customer. Uh, and of course, kits if, uh, increase the efficiencies and obviously reduce the costs. So no need to handle the heavy rolls or uh, cut in, in molds or anything like that. Again, laminate design, always correct fiber rotation. My background is a lot of laminate design, so I key on that all the time. You know, the, the root of that particular blade that you see in the upper right, that's 142 plies of material that's laid down in one layer. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, in the, as far as a tool, if you have to get these big blades out or any type of uh, volume out consistently quickly, you have to go to some type of preform. Um, overlaps are consistent, the fidelity of the stack is consistent, um, the lay down is, is pretty quick, your labor efficiencies go very, very quick. As far as core kit goes, um, obviously you don't have the purchased inventory any longer and the raw material waste associated with it. Uh, we can optimize the resin consumption for you. you tell us um, you know, where, what part you're making and how you're making it and we can design that core to make sure that uh, it has the right cuts and grooves and holes spaced accordingly, which would optimize the, the resin uh, usage, if you will, without compromising the integrity of the process. In other words, the resin can flow as efficiently as it can flow. The permeability of that laminate is not gonna be affected and we wanna hone in on that. It's not necessarily one size fits all. You know, if you want the CK cut, you're going to get it on 20 millimeter centers. That's not necessarily the fact. Uh, we can save up, uh, save obviously labor time, uh, uh, labor hours and cycle time. And we do increase the core placement on high curvature tooling. Uh, we do increase the repeatability. It can go up. We can do this day in and day out. You'll get the same in and the same out all the time. And the accuracy of the placement is second to none. We'll always put that material in the same spot all the time. There's there's no other way to put it. It's like a puzzle on it. It just goes together. Uh, so your cost of goods sold, your bill of material is extremely stable. Uh, your process is stable. Your quality is stable. Everything is uh, pointing in the right direction. Steven, I don't think we have any audio if they're supposed to be for this video.
Okay, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the process. Uh, this, this relates to closed molding and getting the resin into the part as most efficiently as possible without sacrificing the integrity of the laminate, uh, integrity of the process to optimize both resin flow, resin uses, material, and so forth. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the RTML or RTM light. There's a lot of different acronyms for it, but basically a two-sided tool uh, with a fixed cavity dimension that you're stacking with a laminate of whatever. Uh, it could be a single ply, it could be a cord, laminate, and so forth, and you're injecting it somehow with a, a low-pressure resin system. Uh, some of the obvious advantages over a hand layup is your part thickness. Uh, you have two exact you have two exact molds with a specific cavity. You're always going to have the same thickness in part day in and day out, uh, as long as the mold cavities come together like they should, and they seal well. And you're going to have a stable part weight. Uh, you're going to only be able to pack that mold with a certain amount of fiber. It's going to only attack a certain amount of resin system. You're going to get the same uh, same part day in and day out again with a stable mold. Uh, tooling features, you can build anything into the tools that you like. Seals, grooves, landings, uh, pockets for uh, keyways, for hinge pockets, those type of things can go into the uh, B surface as well uh, with no problem at all. Um, optimizes the laminate. Basically, it takes the voids out of the equation now over open molding. Um, open molded hat section at the top, you will have voids in between the uh, core. Uh, the potential in the closed molding just takes takes uh, takes rid of that. It just fills up the entire cavity. Again, some benefits: you have two-sided parts consolidated as one piece. You can mold in uh, features like your core materials, core inserts. Uh, you can have insert within an insert. You can have a core that's a certain density, and then inside that core, you can actually have a, a piece of steel, a piece of aluminum, or a piece of oak, or whatever you need for a hard point, uh, and so forth, with uh, no issues at all. And basically, it optimizes the production rate. Um, you can get uh, very quick rates depending on your resin system and how you tailor that chemistry associated with the fill time. So you want to fill the mold and then you want to have that mold, that uh, resin system start to gel uh, just efficiently as possible after fill. Uh, tooling process is, uh, it is lower cost uh, simply because you're using the same type of tooling that you are for hand layup. You're adding a, a couple seals to it. You have another surface that you have to do, but it's the same material. You don't have to do matched metal molds, uh, high pressure RTM. Uh, you can, but that's not what we're talking about here, uh, to be able to give you a stable platform on uh, manufacturing parts. Complex shapes are a thing now. We can we can manage those pretty efficiently with a double-sided tool, uh, where you don't have to rely on a, on a nylon bag or a vacuum bag or foil, if you will, on the back surface to give you that uh, surface that you need on the B side. Now you can get two A surfaces with no trouble with the complex, uh, you know, complex shapes. Again, cores and inserts. Uh, Princess Yachts, uh, this is the uh, windshield surround, if you will, on that particular product and uh, it works out extremely well. Another process uh, RTM we're gonna talk about now is direct infusion, uh, where we take, um, and I think everybody, well, direct infusion, what, what we mean by that is we directly infuse resin system with a pressure control feedback mechanism. That's key to the success of this whole system. As you're looking at the, you know, you're pumping resin into the part, it's similar to what you would normally use, um, or sometimes people don't, they just use a bucket and just stick a hose in it. And that's the uh, audience that I was from in 1993 is we just had a bucket we stuck hoses in um, and infused that way. But this has a pressure sensor feedback and that's key to everything to make sure that you have just the right amount of pressure, the resin is going in at the right pressure, where you're not ballooning that B surface tool, or if this is a nylon bag, you're not, be, you know, you're not ballooning it out and having to wait for that resin to distribute again down through the laminate because you're forcing resin in too quickly. Um, and this is, uh, that's really key to the whole operation. Direct infusion over traditional, you basically you're reducing the labor, you're reducing the weight, waste associated with the process, with the whole process. Uh, you don't have runaway exotherms associated with it because you're mixing it right at the point of the head. 
uh, the matrix or, or the resin system is degassed prior to mixing and the infusion, so you're controlling the airflow that's going into it. Um, you're accurately controlling the pressure. Obviously, you're monitoring the temperature as well. Um, improved quality laminate. Can't say enough about that. Uh, it does, because of the pressures that are associated with the feedback system going in, you know that you're optimizing the, the right amount of pressure. Uh, you have 14 PSI, let's say, on an empty bag or on a bag with a, a dry stack inside, and then it drops down to four or five PSI as you start to fill in. Well, that doesn't drop any more than that based on your amount of resin that you have associated with it. So your fiber ratios are extremely stable. At, <clears throat> excuse me, you're optimizing the fiber ratios to whatever that uh, whatever that particular architecture can can handle. Some fiber ratios are 65% based on a quadrax. Some are 72% based on a triax. And, and again, it depends on the architecture of your fabric, the permeability of your of your laminate, and so forth, and what you're going to get. But this single point control allows you that flexibility to monitor that process and they give you the quality assurance. And more importantly, it's a repeatable, repeatable process. Using a direct infusion machine uh, will not allow you to start the infusion process until everything is settled. Um, it looks at the vacuum system, it looks at vacuum leaks, it looks at the resin temperature, it looks at the mold temperature. Everything has to be exactly how it's put into the system before the machine allows it to, uh, to start to infuse. So it really takes the quality assurance level of that particular part really high. You know you're not going to shoot a bad part and it's repeatable. This is what we started on at 19.3. Big drums of resin sitting there. You got a bunch of hoses coming out and you're just putting them in and it worked. I mean, it was fine. Uh, the, bigger the, the bigger the product, the more hoses you have, the more complicated manifolds you have. And it starts to get, uh, it starts to get pretty weird. Um, and it's, it's like a symphony, uh, you know, the, the conductor sitting there and opening this tool, opening this uh, feed, closing this vent, making it a feed and so forth. Uh, and it's, it's, it's worked for years. There's, there's nothing to bad to say about it. However, if you want to get the more sophisticated, more repeatability, better quality, less waste, less VOCs that are open to the atmosphere, direct infusion is really the way to, uh, to move. This is a sample of 105 footers, about a little over uh, 2,000 pounds of resin in five hours infusion in this. And you can see the amount of hoses needed for that uh, infusion versus uh, what we had in the past. I mean, it just really takes the, uh, takes the guesswork out of it. And you let the machine technology and the software within that machine take over the infusion process. Uh, look how many people there. I mean, there's there's two there. Uh, you know, typically you'll have three or four in a hundred foot hundred foot hull, uh, checking for leaks, monitoring temperatures, looking at resin flow. Well, all that's done by the software on this machine now. So it really takes the uh, guesswork out of it. You see a lot of spectators up there. Well, that's all they are now is they're spectating. They're not adding to anything, uh, and they don't need to because the uh, the operation is taking over. The process of direct infusion, as far as this large structures or halls, if you will, and the same goes with decks. Uh, folks shouldn't shy away from being able to infuse decks the first time. It's basically the same process, same principle. It just has a little more curvature, has a little more up and down, a little more geometry that you have to take into consideration on where you put your feed lines or how big your feed lines are compared to the vacuum. Uh, but it's all the same process where uh, the principle on this anyway, and there's a number of different ways. We're not saying that this is the way to do it. Um, this is a way that has worked out in in 20 foot skiffs up to 138 foot mine sweepers, uh, where we have a direct line or a central flow line going down the center line of the hull, for example, and we do the same thing for the deck. We go down to the center line and feed outward towards the vacuum. Um, and you can see the, the only thing that's pumping right now is, is that red line, if you will, uh, that's going into the center line. That's what's feeding. And you don't see a lot of different feed lines. You don't need to feed uh, that center line from five or six inlet ports. It's just one. And enough pressure is going in there to feed it. Now, the pressure doesn't stay the same the whole throughout the whole infusion. And the machine software takes care of that. Um, now you're going outboard. A little bit more. Uh, you're going out to the uh, top sides now. You've went out the hull bottom now, and now it's going up to the top sides. Um, 
and then you're comp completing the uh, infusion. Okay, just take a look at what we've talked about. Adaptive tooling, uh, basically it's a rapid production uh, operation where we can get a lot of parts in a little bit of time associated with it. Uh, your, tool, your tool storage now amounts to putting a, a zip drive in your, in your briefcase. You, know, you don't have to have the uh, graveyard that we're all familiar with out back at the shop where you have 20 year old tools sitting there taking up a lot of uh, real estate and being a bunch of lawn ornaments for folks. Um, now you have a, a zip drive that's in your uh, that's in your desk drawer. Highly scalable, uh, one mold really can do literally thousands of different shapes uh, in unique tools, uh, to unique tool surfaces. Of course, your f f facility reduction, your space reduction, your space allocation for tools just went down. Uh, you could use that storage yard out back for uh, some other things, maybe uh, an increase in production facility. Orals are memory stick. Uh, and adaptive membranes are reusable for thousands of castings associated with it. Spray up robotics, uh, maximum flexibility in managing the part size of different shapes. Uh, when you have different shapes, you want to economize or, or maximize the efficiencies of the material that you're using, you're spraying, whether you're spraying resin system, tooling resin, gel coat, uh, you're really uh, managing uh, extreme flexibility and you're increasing your productivity, obviously. You're optimizing your material consumption, you're lowering your VFCs, exposure, uh, and waste associated with spray ups. Um, layup kits, optimize labor again. We're optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. Weight, material consumption, labor associated with uh, with kits. Reduction in purchase inventory and resin consumption is key. Your costs will come down. They have to come down. If you're getting higher fidelity kits and your uh, those core kits are, uh, and people that use them won't probably go back uh, to the old way because they're getting uh, a lot more stability in their process. Increased placement, repeatability, accuracy is, is big. Um, it's big for core kits or fabric kits for that matter. Again, processes. RTM lighters so versus a hand layup. Um, again, this is there's this one process, but it, it does provide an accurate part thickness. It'll get the stable weight, which means you've got a stable bill of material cost. Your cost of goods sold are within 1% of each other. As long as your material comes in under its whatever its uh, requirements are for its tolerances, um, that's what your tolerance is going to be in your actual part. And so you take the guesswork out of it. Uh, tooling features are easily uh, inaccurately placed, um, optimized your laminate, removes and boils, void potential and so forth, and two-sided components are now uh, molded as one. Uh, again, you're optimizing your pr production rates. Uh, you can get higher rates because of the process flows and the material selections that you use for an RTM aren't the same as what you have for an open molding. So they're more conducive to that particular process, which was which will optimize the uh, the flow. Low low cost tooling again, uh, hand layup tooling, same same inability to produce complex shapes, uh, utilizing cores and and uh, direct infusion. Okay, direct infusion, traditional uh, over traditional, you have a reduction in labor time, exothermic risk basically. Your resins degassed prior to mixing and infusing. You're not introducing air into the system, which is key. Uh, uh, you have control over the pressure and the temperature. If you have control over the pressure and the temperature, you have control over the viscosity. If you have control over the viscosity, you have control over the permeability of the material and the rate in which that resin flows through that material, uh, that laminate. Um, you get improved laminate quality and you have a single point control. You're monitoring one piece of equipment uh, to make sure that it's doing, um, that it's conducting the process like it should. Repeatability, again, stable bill of materials and cost of goods associated with, uh, with this whole process. Um, that's, that takes us to the end of the presentation. We have about eight minutes left. Um, some of the uh, key takeaways, again, the adaptive tooling, uh, the direct infusion kits, they all help with optimizing your costs, optimizing your labor, 
put your labor to good use where you need to and let technology take over where it should take over in the, in the process. Great, thank you, Stephen. We've, um, we've had a couple of questions that came in um, from the audience. So I wanna um, spend a couple of minutes trying to get to those. Um, uh, first one I have here, um, do you work mostly with thermoset or thermoplastic composites um, or a bit of both? Traditionally, right now, we're, we're heavily invested in the thermo, thermo set side of things. Uh, thermoplastics, we do have a little bit of technology with over in Europe. Uh, the U.S. is uh, pretty much focused on the thermo set side, though. We do have experience in the thermoplastic, but right now we do not, <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say we don't. Uh, we can offer some thermoplastic type fabrics associated with that industry, uh, but as far as tooling and actual part manufacturing, it's thermo set based. Uh, we have someone asking um, if you uh, can work with the Latin American region um, from your North Carolina base. We can. Uh, from North Carolina, we service uh, North America, South America. Uh, some of the technology <clears throat> that we have here is, is cross-linked, if you will, on a global basis. Uh, our colleagues in Turkey and Europe help us out. We help them out. So uh, we can certainly service uh, directly Latin America, South America from, uh, from, from Charlotte. Okay. Um, are there uh, any particular manufacturing processes that um, you guys have the most experience in? Well, we all started with open molding. Uh, that seems to be a thing in our rear view mirror now. Uh, we're extremely well versed in closed molding, whether it's vacuum infusion, RTM, RTM light, uh, those are uh, keys to us and we're, we're considered experts in those fields. Um, autoclave, prepreg, we also have a good understanding and good working knowledge of the materials associated with it and we do supply some fabrics for the, for the uh, prepreg side of things. Um, so we're versed in that, but closed molding is really our, uh, our niche. Um, in regards to uh, hand layup on large structures without cores and use of cutting machines for in-house cutting, uh, do you guys have any experience to share about taking a 3D model to product and removing the hand cutting um, at the table or on the mold? Again, it's taking, yes, um, it's similar to what we're doing in our kitting operation, uh, both in the, in the U.S. and in Europe and Turkey. Uh, where we'll take a 3D model um, and nest it to develop the patterns. We'll, once we have the laminate schedules, we'll develop the patterns associated with those. Uh, so you'll get the boat in a box, if you will, or however you want to term it. Uh, so you don't have to cut anything. You'll have a map, you'll get a booklet associated with, um, with that particular kit, whether it's glass or, or core, um, and you follow the kit out. Now, what we do is we're with you for the first two or three articles or until uh, the kit works out all the kinks and the details, if there are any uh, challenges with it, we need to make it overlap a little bit bigger, a little bit less, those type of things. And then uh, we'll help orchestrate where the kits, you know, the alignments of the parts and so forth. But we do take, uh, we do like the 3D models. That is the, the most efficient way. And when I say efficient, I mean from a cost or a, uh, a timing perspective, uh, how quick we can get the kits back uh, to you. Um, um, kind of in someone's asking about in terms of logistics, um, typically how long um, does it take from when a client first contacts you to um, like ready to use implementation? Mm, really depends. Uh, if you're talking about glass kits, um, we can go from a starting, you know, starting stop, if you will, to actually producing and, and issuing those kits in about three weeks. Uh, depending on the complexity and the laminate schedule and so forth. Obviously, the materials, if we have the materials on the shelf, uh, that's one thing. If we have to produce the materials, that takes a little bit more time uh, before we actually produce the kit. Uh, so it's kind of dependent on the laminate and, uh, and what's required. Uh, but it's, it's not a long, long time. I mean, it's not a long duration between uh, start and finish. Um, and kind of similarly, somebody has asked about um, 
uh, if you can kind of describe the support staff that you guys have um, to undertake evaluation and execution um, throughout the process. Um, and you touched a little bit on training at the very beginning. Mm, sure. Um, well, medics' capacity is really cradle to grave. We have structural engineers, we have people that can run finite element analysis, we have folks that can do the mechanical testing associated with laminates. From there, we can <clears throat> when we provide the uh, laminate booklets, if you will. When we can develop a laminate for, for a company, we'll end up giving you or giving the company a booklet, uh, a lamination ply by ply or page by page, if you will, booklet on how the thing goes together and what it is. We can uh, we have the design capacity capability, then we'll transfer that into the operation side. We'll say, okay, XYZ, we need this material. Uh, we go out to our production control folks and say, you know, we need a quadrax, triax, biax, whatever the thing is, in whatever the input, um, E glass, R glass, Kevlar, whatever we're dealing with. We'll then take it over to our technicians that are able to nest. Uh, through computers, so we're able to nest those patterns that we need and develop the patterns, nest them into the software associated with our with our cutters. We'll take it over to our cut group, our cutting cell, if you will, and we'll have them trim it and, and cut the kits to whether it goes on the CNC or our, or our fabric cutter. Um, just depends on what we're cutting, and from there it'll uh, logistically transfer out. We have uh, manufacturing engineers that understand the process that can go out and to help train uh, individuals of the RTM light or the RTM process or even closed molded infusion. Uh, we have technicians that can go out and, uh, and be a support uh, entity for customers that aren't quite sure of the process and need a little bit of help associated with that. We have our technicians that go out and help support that as well. Uh, so it's really from a clean sheet of paper to your first article, uh, quality control checks. It's basically a la carte. Um, control, you know, the design, the engineering, the analysis, the kitting, uh, the disposables. Uh, don't forget about the disposables, I'm telling myself. <laughs> we have vacuum bags, peel ply, flow membrane, hoses, uh, tacky tape. Uh, we have our own line of spray adhesive, uh, a Metafix that actually uh, adheres, and we're working on uh, fabric coating uh, for that same adhesive where you just peel the membrane and you stick the fabric, uh, which will help uh, eliminate the spray can, reduce your costs, uh, VOCs, all that, and all that good stuff as well. So uh, we can really handle every every aspect of a manufacturing process or manufacturing cycle. Excellent. Um, we have one more question. Um, I know we're at time. Um, so one more question. I did want to note, um, we have had a couple of people ask about pricing. Um, I know, Stephen, when we discussed that, um, we said that you would really like to talk to people before you discuss pricing. Um, so when you finish the webinar today, you're going to get a survey that pops up on your screen um, right when you close out. Um, we would really appreciate if you would spend a minute um, responding to the survey and then you can also drop in your contact information right there and indicate uh, that you have a question and Stephen will be in contact with you soon so you can start to talk about that. Um, but our last question um, is about sustainability. So, so sustainability um, in composites is a topic of growing interest. Uh, can medics help manufacturers with optimizing the manufacturing process to reduce waste and become more efficient to help companies become more sustainable? Absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot of technology out there that we're familiar with, uh, and because we have a global footprint, we understand what's going on in Europe, they understand what's going on in the U.S. that may not have cross-pollinated already. Uh, so we're keen on understanding the operation efficiencies uh, that are needed in a particular uh, culture, if you will. Uh, not all closed molded shops are the same. They all have a little bit different, uh, a different culture base. And, we have to understand that pretty quickly going in and what they're used to, what they're what they're new to, uh, but we can help with optimizing processes through through the product offers we have and value added services that you get uh, using the Medix product lines as well as the the technical support associated with those products. We can certainly help you uh, sustain and, and get better and better and better as you move forward for sure. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think that is all the questions that we have today. Uh, thank you to our audience um, for being really interactive. It's great with the polls. 
Um, Stephen, your videos that you had today were all very helpful. Um, I appreciate those. Uh, thank you to Medics for partnering with us on this webinar. Um, we will have the recording going out later this week. A lot of people have asked for that recording, so we will have that going out. Um, please remember to finish the survey that's going to pop up on your screen, especially if you want Stephen um, to reach out to you um, in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, thank you, Martha, and thank you all for attending again.